I, uh, it's a great pleasure to be presenting this work to you today because I'm, uh, I'm going to be covering material from Building Technologies as well as the Indoor Environment Group and the Energy Analysis uh, Department. We at, in EETD, the buildings work, there's a lot of uh, it obviously in Building Technologies, but there's work in the other um, departments as well. Uh, I'm going to talk about building energy use in the United States, a little bit about China and, and uh, India, but you've heard some of that, and, and so I don't think I'll need to go through that in much detail. I'm going to talk about technology systems and tools and processes, and I'm going to talk about buildings in the grid. Um, I also run the Demand Response Research Center for the California Energy Commission, and uh, I brought with me my, my PG&E Energy Orb, which I'll tell you about a little bit later when we get to that part of the talk. Um, it's blue right now, meaning it's a normal day. It's not a grid day. Uh, so well, I'll bring this out when that part of the talk comes. And uh, I'm going to talk to you a little about uh, future directions, because uh, the Buildings Energy Research Agenda is in a, in a phenomenal time with Secretary Chu at the Department of Energy. There's tremendous opportunity to mobilize LBNL to really accelerate innovation in, in buildings. And I want to give you a little bit of an introduction into where those opportunities are. Um, we will be working with the material science division and the computational sciences folks. So um, there's great opportunities now to do things in buildings that we haven't been able to do in the past because there's an awareness of the government of the need to do these things. Um, you've heard about industry and transportation and buildings. So here, we're different from China. Buildings are the largest end use. Where in, in most developing countries, in, in many countries, industry is the largest. But in the United States, buildings are the largest. So that's very important. We need to be spending a lot of time on, on addressing buildings. And it's increasing. So we build more buildings, and they're using more energy. We, we have a big job to set that trajectory the other way. If you look at buildings, it's 70% of the electricity systems. It is the smart grid. So the way we run buildings, we're going to talk about not just how much you use, but when you use it. And if you look at the end uses, residential and commercial are similar in magnitude. So we use about the same amount total energy use in those two sectors. Um, lighting is the biggest end use in commercial, but heating, ventilation, and air conditioning is large. Heating is the largest in residential, but they also have lighting and miscellaneous loads. And one of the challenges in the research is the diversity of end use loads. So whether we're doing lighting or insulation, and I should say we need insulation and innovation. Uh, so I know uh, Gates was saying we need innovation, not insulation. But uh, Building 90 is an R1 or R2 wall, and we'd be much more comfortable and use less energy if we had insulation. Better windows. Um, oops. So this slide you've seen already, um, but I'm going to just make a comment. Here we're talking about the electric utilities and the decoupling. So what that means is the utilities in California actually profit from the energy efficiency programs they run. We have something called public goods charges that are used for energy efficiency programs that help achieve some of the flattening of this uh, GDP, uh, energy per GDP, um, energy per person. And, uh, but also we have very aggressive codes. Our Title 24 codes influence new construction and LBNL is involved in all of the code cycles. So we get very involved in developing technology that we move into the building codes. And this is not all from efficiency programs that the utilities run. We're very involved in those as well. So California is a great place for LBNL to be located because we have a state uh, that Art Rosenfeld has helped influence uh, the technical agenda for the building sector. Uh, we've made great marks here. I'm going to spend a few minutes on this slide giving you an overview of some of the variety of things that we do here in, in LBNL and buildings. One of the things we do is research to reduce the loads, the external loads. So the cool roofs that many of you heard about is an example of that. The cool roof system is a low albedo coatings that are reflective so that the, the building has less of a cooling load. So we're actually reducing the solar gain and the, we can put in a smaller air conditioner and use less energy, and the people are more comfortable. Now, for a large commercial building, that's less important because we have a different footprint, and the solar gains are, are less of the total loads. In the commercial building, the internal gains from the lighting and the miscellaneous equipment and the people are the dominant loads. So we have different needs in different kinds of buildings and in different climates. 
Um, we've done a lot of work in facades and windows and passive venting and things like that. And this picture here shows we actually characterized the performance of windows. And LBNL was involved in, in starting something called the National Fenestration Rating Council. So we actually labeled the performance of windows. So when you buy a window now, just like your car has a miles per gallon rating, your window has a rating. And the science to do those ratings was developed here. And we're also developing photochromic windows um, that actually can change their, their characteristics. So they can either let more light in, let more heat in, depending on what you need. And the dynamic facade is part of the concept of the future, where the building may actually be responding to what's going on in the building and what's going on outside. If you have a lot of solar gain coming on, you might uh, actually dim the window like this, uh, and, and you'll have less glare. Um, at the same time, you need the lighting control system to be responsive to what's happening on the window. So we go from the facade to the control systems. And here is a picture from the New York Times building where the windows have light. And you can see the lamps near the window are off. And as we go towards the inner part of the space, the light's on. So we have dimming systems that also measure occupancy. And we heat and cool and light and ventilate a lot of spaces where nobody is. So there, as we talk about buildings, we're going to talk about the loads, minimizing the loads, and then actually managing the use. So it's not just what's in the building, but it's how we control that. And, and the, the opportunity in the future is to run the buildings as integrated systems. Uh, our material science department is doing a lot of work now in uh, electrochromic windows and maybe even harvesting windows so that we actually can have thermoelectric devices on windows that take advantage of a change in temperature across a space. So we're starting to develop systems and components that actually are going to utilize some of the heat flows um, in, in spaces. Now miscellaneous plug loads, uh, LBNL is also known for the vampire loads, we call them, where you have a lot of things plugged in your wall. So we have a one watt standby policy that Alan Meyer helped to pioneer. And that's made a huge difference worldwide. There's still a lot to do on that, because the we all have a lot of devices plugged in our homes. So the miscellaneous loads in homes have been increasing. While we get better with the lights and the insulation and the heating and cooling, other loads are coming in to, to, to play. Um, duct sealing is, a, is a quite an interesting one, because it's not how efficient the heating or cooling system is, it's the distribution of the heating and cooling system within the, within the home or commercial building. So that you might have a, a package unit, a rooftop unit at one place, and ducts that leak. So at the end of the duct run, um, a lot of the heating and cooling is actually lost. And so the system is not efficient. And the duct sealing system actually is an aerosol spray that seals the ducts. And that was pioneered here at LB now. When we look at the system efficiency, new ducts have to be sealed. And uh, uh, we want to make sure that the, when, when we heat and cool and we distribute air, that air gets to where it needs to go. Data center efficiency. Um, that's, of course, a new load. Uh, we, we, LBNL has a long tradition of looking at PC energy use. We talked about plug loads. We actually worked with uh, Kathy Zoy on the very first Energy Star products um, uh, in the mid-90s, I think it was, when Energy Star, EPA started labeling devices. The first device they labeled was a power-saving monitor and a power-saving PC. So as we look at buildings, we study where the energy is being used. And we went from mainframe computers back to desktop computers and now data centers and mainframes again. So we continue to look at these um, electronic loads and where they are and how to run them more efficiently. And one of the things we're doing at the Demand Response Research Center is actually, oh, did I touch something? Got it back. Um, we are uh, uh, looking at demand response. Uh, and I'll talk about that a little bit later. But in data centers, they're often overcooled. And we might be able to reduce the electric loads from the data center on days when the grid is um, full uh, and actually let the data centers run a little bit warmer, maybe 50 hours a year that they wouldn't do every year, every day. Now, these last three, I have uh, evaluating and managing energy use. And there's three things I listed here. Benchmarking and commissioning, monitoring simulation and modeling, and indoor environmental quality metrics. Um, benchmarking, Lynn gave you sort of an overview of some of the benchmarking of cement industries. And we benchmark buildings. So we've worked a lot with EPA, just the way they 
can put an EPA label on your television, an Energy Star label, they put them on buildings. And so we do a lot of work with rating buildings, um, graphics like this that have the distribution of energy efficiency, energy use per square foot for different building types. Um, this picture here is the concept of fault detection and diagnostics. <coughs> So in the future, we want to run models in real time that take the actual use of the building and run a model and help us see where the waste is. Maybe the lights are on and your model says there's enough solar outside and the lights near the windows need to be dimmed. Or a fan gets left on, and I'll show you some examples of that. So there's a tremendous need to move these models into our control systems. Because today, we pay utility bills once a month and we run the building we actually need to measure energy use in real time. And I'll, I'll go through that a little bit more. In, indoor environmental quality is extremely important because there's people in buildings. And the people, the buildings are for people to be productive and healthy. And uh, we can't not ventilate or not light. But we need to know the range of ventilation requirements to keep people healthy. Uh, so we do a lot of measurements about indoor air chemistry and indoor air pollutants and how to ventilate and create healthy environments with the least amount of energy. And that's one of the challenges as we get to really low energy buildings is designing that right set of activities. In, in some homes in Germany, um, they use air-to-air -air heat exchangers. So they actually preheat the incoming air with the outgoing air. And, and in many climates, you, you do things like that with heat wheels and heat recovery. Here in California, we don't do that. So we don't have a sense of why you would need to do that. We open the door and it's not too bad outside. But there's a lot of places when you get to really low energy buildings you need to ventilate them. And homes traditionally in our area haven't been ventilated and that's actually coming more. It's a new end use to actually ventilate homes continuously. Um, home Energy Saver. How many of you have heard of Home Energy Saver? Pretty, pretty good, maybe about uh, two thirds or about half. Um, home Energy Saver is a tool, uh, it's a simulation model where you put information about your home and it gives you suggestions on what you can do. It's um, based on DO2, which is a computer simulation program to model energy in buildings. And this newer tool is called Energy Plus. So Energy Plus is a, a model that allows you to design low energy buildings or to evaluate energy efficiency strategies in buildings. And that's a very important um, tool for the building codes and for design analysis. And I'll talk a little about where that's going in the future. Now, one of the challenges in buildings is that we don't test them. So um, Ashok showed you those really low energy buildings that are using more than they're predicted to use. We've known about these processes from industrial engineering, and nobody would build uh, a, a, an electron microscope without testing it to make sure it's working when they buy it from the vendor. But what happens here, this is the theory of what should happen if buildings were engineered, and the energy design criteria is not as important in common practice as it should be. So when you saw Ashok talk about those buildings um, and they didn't perform like they were intended, they probably didn't go through very rigorous testing. And the design of these tests need to include what the design intent, did the owner have a design target? And at each step of the way, was he able to say this is something he's actually gonna be able to build? So this concept of commissioning is, is one that our systems have not been subject to, that, that owners hand over buildings and then uh, operators actually don't understand them and they haven't gone through this rigorous testing. This continuous monitoring is, is what needs to change. They have to be continuously monitored and we have to start tracking their performance in real time. So some of you have heard of the Prius effect. If you had feedback, you'd drive your car different. If you had feedback in your building, maybe you'd run the building different. And we know that most building operators have no idea how much energy their building is using. Um, equipment is often on when it's not needed. And even when it's on, it may not be running efficiently. So we actually see some heating and cooling systems might be heating and cooling at the same time. So they're actually fighting. Uh, we find uh, something called an economizer, which lets more outdoor air in, uh, uh, broken. So, so, so a lot of systems are actually not functioning well. And this is a picture from UC Santa Barbara. It's the physical science building at the Santa Barbara campus. This is just the electric load shape. Um, and this technology was installed um, at UC Santa Barbara, actually following the electricity crisis using demand response funds from the government. 
And they had an a energy manager who actually looked at the data. So that's also what has to change is it's nobody's job to look at the data. So this guy found that actually the fans were running all night long, 465 kilowatts, and he was actually able to change the control sequence and save a couple hundred kilowatts every day. Now that seems very trivial, but it's amazing how often this, is, this happens. Um, it requires people. And one of our challenges is using simulation models or computer models or fault diagnostic methods to find those problems. What should the load shape look like? What does it look like? How do I run the building to make it run more efficiently? Um, so a simple electric load shape, just the hourly loads, gives you some concept of design intent. Um, and this research that we've been doing in these kinds of tools led to something called monitoring-based commissioning which is funded by these public goods charges that I was talking about that the utilities in California offer. So of the first 24 buildings that went through the monitoring-based commissioning program, they spent about $3 million, a dollar a square foot, and they had a two and a half year payback from fixing things. They were simply fixing things in existing buildings. So one of the things we do is we run the building better, another thing we do is retrofit, and another thing we do is be more aggressive with new design. Um, and I'll, I'll talk a little about some of those, but essentially those are some of the important things for the buildings industry. Now this here is um, from a study of commissioning where we actually, again, we're putting money into that process of testing things and making sure they're working. And each of these uh, bubbles, these, these circles, is percent savings. So this one here shows the schools, there was a three-year payback, and they were using about 50 cents a square foot. The building out here, the laboratories, were using, on average, $3.50 a square foot, and they saved about 15 to 20% from fixing the building. So we, we know from an engineering perspective, we can save energy just by running the building better. And the other question is, do these savings persist? So, so that's one of the challenges. If it's only a two and a half year payback, it has to persist for two and a half years and it pays back. That would be great, or it'd be better, great if it persisted longer. Um, and, and we do not have the continuous monitoring tools to get those savings in the long run. Now, um, now I'm gonna talk about my orb here. Um, the definition of energy efficiency means that you're getting the most service with the least amount of energy. Um, and we have a long way to go there, but conceptually, um, when we look at the electric grid, we think about, um, are we doing efficiency? But as we move to the right, we care not just about when we're using energy, I mean, how much energy, but when. So, so we use so much energy per year. Um, I talked about paybacks and, and energy. So now we care about time of use management. And as the electric grid in California has the renewable portfolio standards that put more wind and solar on the grid, the grid actually becomes more dynamic, and the policy of the state is to have real-time pricing. We don't have elasticity in the demand side now. So um, we've been working on technology to help us change the service level dynamically, automatically, when we go into these demand response events where the demand is responding to an event. The demand may respond to a price, it may respond to a reliability signal, and it also may respond to spinning reserve markets, which happen on minute time scales. And we were just this morning having a, a lighting a technology um, advisory group meeting about ancillary services and, and dimming lighting. And you, the California has about uh, two and a half gigawatts out of about 50 gigawatts of ancillary services. So what an ancillary service is, is a, is a generator's waiting to help reg up or reg down the grid. So it's actually frequency response or other kinds of spin. So some power plants run to help manage the grid stability, and the demand side systems can actually unload or load very quickly. Um, so going to time scales of demand response, this is a PGD energy orb, and the blue means that it's, um, it's a normal day. On a critical peak day, it turns orange the day before and then red during the event. Um, so this next slide here, Got my slide here. Uh, this is what, if pg e gave you an orb, uh, they would ask you to look at the color here and change the way you run your building depending on the color of the orb. These were initially for stock traders. They're called ambient orb devices, and you could, you could uh, program them to 
uh, change color if your stock hit a particular price. Um, and they're, they're considered a background. They also have three power modes. They have uh, low, medium, and high, and I keep mine on low. Um, and I measured my ore because I wanted to see if it was a one watt standby, and it's, it's a little more than one watt, but it has different colors. Um, so, so that's the orb. So the orb, so here, now let me make a couple comments about the electric grid. As we go from 45 gigawatts to 50 gigawatts, that's less than 1% of the hours, okay? So we actually have to have more transmission and distribution and more power plants just for a couple hours. So the whole system has to be bigger and it's very expensive. Those peak hours drive the economics. If we can reduce the peak, the whole system becomes cheaper, the, those, those peak prices are less, and we have a lot of inland load growth in California, Palm Springs, Bakersfield, so that peak is growing faster than the base load. So our load factor is bad. So that's why we want, on a hot summer day, we want the systems in the buildings to be responsive. So PG&E will give you an orb, and they'll call you up, and they'll page you, and they will email you. Um, but what we've done is we've developed an automation system. This blue box here is a, um, a Linux PC. It's a, a client to an automation server. And we have um, over 80 megawatts now, a couple hundred buildings in California that use this technology. We automate all the demand response programs that the utilities offer, critical peak pricing, demand bidding, capacity bidding, uh, peak day pricing, and even ancillary services where we shed in an IKEA uh, in Palo Alto in less than a minute. So we, we're allowing the state to automate the price response or the reliability programs. And um, the box is not what it'll look like in the future, though. The box is um, an interim device. Uh, and there's over 50 companies have embedded our client in their control systems. So the lighting systems that I showed you earlier, dimming lighting is the best technology because winter or summer, it'll sh you can shed load. And we've also done cold winter mornings in Seattle. Um, so this is becoming a national standard. We want all buildings of the future to be able to receive signals in a common language from the electric system. And each of the utilities in California have one of our automation servers. These are continuously listening to, to the systems. And in the future, when you run your building, you'll say, what's the price of electricity tomorrow? What's the weather? How many people? And you may pre-cool it and run it differently depending on the price of electricity and the dynamic controls. So some of these things I just said to you, but, but essentially here, this is what a shed looks like where we have 28 buildings participating. We've done this for seven years now. And uh, as I said, it's becoming a national standard. I'll be over at a, a, a utility communications meeting tomorrow um, in PG&E territory. And we shed, we pre-program the building to go into a low power mode. We reset zone temperatures. We reset light levels. We've done this in industrial. We, we've done it with compressed air and data centers and, and pharmaceuticals. Um, so we're enabling buildings to listen to common signals, and it allows more renewables on the grid. So whether you're buying from the grid or in a microgrid, you want load flexibility. Um, and sometimes people try things for demand response, and they say, I can do it every day. So it actually lets them know, uh, are they even running efficiently now? Um, and we need to better measurements to actually say, what's the building doing? So we talked about time scales of flexibility. And this is where we're doing a lot of work now, where dimming lighting can shed very, very quickly. We may actually, we actually the lights may come on in the nighttime to help balance the grid when the wind is spilling. You know, so, so the demand side is participating in the supply side to make the system to enable more, uh, to get rid of the peaks and enable more um, renewables. We, we're trying to move this into Title 24, so every building would be required to have a client that can listen to these common signals, um, native low power mode. So we put our <coughs> building into a low power mode, like our laptop, when we unplug it, and it's running on battery mode. Um, and this model predictive control is, is one of the most interesting things where we actually have models running. And this is a pre-cooling slide here where we actually um, pre we run the building a little cooler in the morning and a little warmer in the afternoon, and we actually use the mass of the building, um, which we've done in many buildings, including Chabot Space Science, um, and we did it actually at um, the NERSC building downtown Oakland. Um, so we've been working in, in many buildings around California. I think I have just a couple more. Um, the, 
simulation research agenda for buildings is a fascinating topic because we're going from very coarse models to very fine-grained models, kind of like climate modeling. It's those edge effects where we care a lot about how the models perform. And here in this picture, we're showing you a virtual controls test bed where we can test new energy efficiency <coughs> strategies in virtual buildings. So we actually need better tools, computational fluid dynamics, lighting tracing, um, backnet control systems, this little box, my, like my box listening to signals, and these HVAC and, and libraries. This is an extremely important area for us to be able to test different control strategies in virtual platforms. And the computational science agenda here is tremendous because of the type of heat flows and electrical systems we're modeling in the buildings. Um, so what do we need to do as a nation? Essentially, what we need to do is aggressively look at new buildings and existing buildings. And we have some stock models, assuming over time the new buildings are the green ones, the existing ones are the blue ones. Technically, when we do work in buildings, we have three categories, technical potential, economic potential, and market potential. And this is technically feasible, that we would aggressively retrofit the stock and we would aggressively go after uh, new buildings like the numbers that Ashok showed for the state of California. If we did that by 2030, we have a set of scenarios that show uh, we could reduce by 2030 more than the current nuclear power. Half the coal of the current consumption could be replaced with technically with, with aggressive energy efficiency. So it's possible, but to mobilize our country towards that activity is going to require a huge effort and investment in, in, the, in, in scaling up, as, as, as uh, Ashok was saying, and, and Lynn as well, scaling up the efficiency investments. And Ashok showed this as well, with China growing and India growing, we need to quickly do these things and deploy them abroad as well. Um, this is, I think, my <coughs> second to last slide. Building 90 now has an energy information system. I have the URL here. I think these will be posted for you folks. Um, this is an hourly electric load shape of the building. You can see the weekdays. You can see the high nighttime loads. Um, so this is electric only. Um, and the green is there, a 10% savings baseline uh, based on a historical model. Um, so one of the challenges in Building 90 is that um, the electric loads are distributed among different circuits. So this is actually a picture of the panels. Here's first floor lighting, which was clean. But to get to this second floor lighting, we had to go through all these different panels. And you'll see there's a, the, this is the fourth floor plugs. This is lighting and plugs. So buildings aren't. Um, circuited to allow end use metering. And that's one of the things we need to do in the future is actually improve our ability to measure the end uses. So um, I think Paul showed this to you yesterday, and I'm going to uh, give you an idea of how to put, think about the research agenda in the buildings to create more responsive buildings. The buildings are the components I showed you, the, the, the facade, the HVAC systems that provide comfort and, and air quality, the lighting and equipment. Um, and the first thing we do is we have to be sure that the buildings are comfortable and healthy. Uh, they have to provide environments where people can interact with them. We actually know that if people can change their set points in their office, they're happier, and they'll, they'll tolerate a larger spread. If they can change their lights, they're happier. So responsiveness for the occupants is an important part of the future. The grid we talked a little about. So we want to say, can my building give anything back right now? Uh, can it give something back three hours from now? Can it do something tonight and store power? And I didn't mention phase change material. So we actually have phase change material built into the walls that may pre-cool it at night and then cool the occupants during the day. And then the natural environment. So we're doing a lot with passive ventilation and, and convective cooling and heating systems that, that actually take, take use, optimal use of the outside environment. The, the San Francisco Federal Building in, in downtown San Francisco is passively ventilated and passively cooled. And you can do that in San Francisco. You can't do that in Phoenix. So, so you've got to build the building for the, for the climate. And then the way we do that is to have these continuous models that have better ma monitoring than we have today and integrated operating systems. So we run the building as a system. Uh, the New York Times building, it'll, it'll shut the blinds and change the lighting level or vice versa. So if the blinds come down because of glare, the next morning they come up again, and that happens automatically. Somebody doesn't have to remember to do that. 
So these automation systems and integrated control is a very important part of the future. This is my last slide. Um, so we've talked about the need to mobilize the science. There's actually a tremendous amount of materials and modeling work um, to build low, low energy components, storage, efficient equipment, continuous measurement, and new metrics. We want to measure the services that the building's delivering. We want to visual, visualize the waste. We want to see how the systems are performing. Um, and we need to do that while we're providing a good indoor environment. This is the Building 90 test bed that we just received stimulus money to build. It's a, um, a, a net zero energy test bed that's designed to look at uh, daylighting and facade systems, HVAC systems, virtual controls test bed, and let manufacturers actually come in and try out their products, kind of like our Windows test bed currently. So it's, it's under design. It's intended to be built at Building 90, where this would be a user facility for the nation to do building integration controls. And my last comment is this stool that um, I've been talking mostly about technology and a little about process. But the policy and the markets are critical to taking these ideas into the market moving forward. So I'll stop right there and answer questions. Go ahead. Uh -huh. It was the, you'll remember it, it's the underperformance of the LEED certified buildings. Uh -huh. yeah, it's the underperformance of a lot of the LEED certified buildings, right. um, particularly those that had very aggressive, um, low energy use targets. Right. Um, could some of the technologies, I mean, presumably some of the things that you're talking about were installed in those buildings. Yes. So what, what can, so can you tell me, did they install them like backwards or something? Well, you know, that's a good I mean, question and I don't know. So, so, so seems to me a lot, a lot could be learned from going back and fixing those. I, presumably they were, those are new buildings where right. a lot of effort right. and thought went into to, uh, trying to reduce the energy consumption, yet something didn't yeah. quite work so, out. So the answer is why? Why is the energy higher? Not just, yes, it's higher, but why? Yeah. And there's a couple By reasons factors why. factors of two or three in some yeah. cases. So, I mean, so one is, wow. as you go into those low energy use intensities, there were some that were at 30 kb2s per square foot per year. But most of them at 30, the, the actual was two or three times that, right? So, okay. so yeah. So, okay, so, so, that, yeah. so one reason is that the models that they used when they said 30, it didn't include the parking lot lights or the kitchen in the basement. So sometimes the 30, the performance they said was the design target did not include all the loads that are in the real building. Okay, so they use someone else's software, not, not, not Be, your No, 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 no. Okay. Most buildings don't go through okay. a, 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 an energy simulation process like the type I described. Okay, okay, I that, see. That's probably the number one answer is that the, the, the science and the engineering uh, procedures we use to design low energy buildings are not sufficient to predict actual performance. That's a state of the science issue. Wow. <laughs> the simulation models that, that we the simulation models that we have were developed for conventional buildings and tweaking them a little bit. If you want to do a radically difficult design like using the the waste heat from the chiller to heat the water or the hot water heater, the current simulation model cannot do that because So we need to do we need to do our models. So, yeah. so, so there's another there's a there's another grand challenge, and that is two buildings side by side. One may use five times with same technology. One may use five times more energy because of people and behavior. So so that's true in homes. Is it true in commercial buildings? And I showed you a fan that gets left on. So so in fact, some of that might be as they commission those buildings, make it maybe they can bring them down again too. So so it's a, we don't actually know. We know a class of we know a class of problems, but the specific problems are very diverse. Um, so first of all, thanks, Marianne, for the talk. It was really informative, and it was good to hear uh, kind of a, a synergy of what's going on in, in building technologies. Um, but a question regarding demand response: uh, It seems like right now, in its current incarnation, the auto ADR is. is an economic win, both for the utilities and for consumers. Um, but it doesn't seem 
clear to me at this point that the environmental <laughs> benefits are there. With mm -hmm. things like peak shifting, maybe you move a peak away from um, you know, the middle of the day when it's primarily natural gas plants and you move it into the night when you're mm -hmm. burning dirty coal. Mm -hmm. um, so how, I guess how, how far along that triangle you showed uh, do we have to get until the environmental benefits are really there and, and how far away is that mm -hmm. uh, time-wise? So, so that's a good question. Um, in, in demand response, we do three things. We limit load, we shift load, and we shed load. So typically when we shed, so we, say, say we run the building a little warmer from 1 to 3 p.m., we're not shifting. So we're just literally taking a chunk, we're curtailing service, and, and we're not displacing it to a different time of day. When you shift, you're right that um, you may use the same amount of energy, or you may use slightly more sometime. Um, industrial processes often will do things at night when it's cheaper, but the question about the CO2 and the day nighttime, it does vary around the country, what, the, what the, um, the difference between day and nighttime, whether it's cleaner or not. So, so it's not a simple question. And one could imagine having CO2 per kilowatt hour in real time, so using that as an optimization. Um, so, but it might be a proxy in price in the future as well. So, so those, are, those are worth continuing to look at. Yeah, there is, and uh, the work in homes is similar to what we're doing in commercial buildings, and that is we look at the facade, we look at the heating and ventilation, we look at the lighting, um, we look at the control systems. There's a lot in these smart homes. Microsoft actually visited us to talk about this technology, and, and all the big control companies have smart home agendas. We didn't talk about sort of the, the instrumented home of the future, but there's a tremendous agenda in actually providing these feedbacks for your home, and that's coming with PG&E's advanced meter infrastructure and Zigbee devices and things like that. Um, so, so, and LBNL does a lot of work in deep retrofits in homes and, and how to accelerate energy efficiency in homes. The home energy saver I mentioned is a tool for home energy analysis, and they're p developing a, an energy pro, sort of a professional auditor tool f for people that are retrofitting homes. Other questions? Right. By 2015, but, uh, it's not clear the protocols are there and so on. Right. Right. So um, this blue box, um, we're embedding the controls, we're embedding these clients in control systems. That same client um, could be embedded in a, a, a home automation system that then communicates to the, to the appliances or in the appliance itself. So we're actually looking at uh, it's called Open ADR, Open Automated Demand Response, and harmonizing the data models with the something called Zigbee Smart Energy Profile, so that PG&E's price um, models that get distributed from their servers to the homes is the same language as this. Um, so we have met with Panasonic, Toshiba, uh, GE, Whirlpool, and they're very aware of these languages of prices and um, they will be embedding this kind of technology. So it's expensive, though. So your, um, for example, they have a, a dryer that has different levels of electric um, uh, drying cycles. So if you're in demand response mode, it's going to use the less energy intensive one. Uh, there's a, there's a, a freezer that GE has that pre-freezes before the event. So, and it'll let the freezer temperature float a bit. So the concept of what we do in commercial buildings, it's being mimicked at the appliance device, but it may be a while before you see them, and they are more expensive. So, so in some utility environments like California's, where there will be dynamic pricing, um, people can save some money by having these appliances. So the utilities want to, um, in a sense, certify some of these um, d devices on their grid systems. Thanks so much.